Hello, this is when I stopped in the previous segment. So now we're going to start working on the individual minerals. And we're going to start with the, the silicates, as I mentioned it in the end of the other. And this way, you have to, here you will have to know the different silicates. And um, we categorize that by their anion, I mean cations, like the iron and magnesium. So these guys we call ferro, which stands for iron, magnesium, which stands for magnesium, silicates. These are, remember, naso actually isolated or island, but another name, this is also a synonym, is the nasosilicate. So it is isolated, but you can also call it island. These are all synonyms. So the first one, which is a ferromagnesium silicate with uh, isolated silica oxygen tetrahedron, is the olivine. Here is the formula, but of course you do not have to know the formula. But when you do look at it, you can see it's SiO4. And these are the cations. Uh, uh, remember, the SiO4 originally had uh, four negative charges, SiO4. That's the formula of the isolated silica oxygen tetrahedra with negative four charges. And here the magnesium and the iron is what fulfills that four negative charges. So you can imagine in, in space, his, here are the tetrahedrons and surrounding them are the magnesium and iron atoms. So that's how it looks like. Olivine is usually green, uh, very pretty. Very rarely it occurs as, as its own element. Most of the time it's in igneous rocks as low inclusions, just like you see on these pictures. And in the lab, that's what we got. So some of the olivine will have this low back rock background because that's how we collect them. There is an olivine, we call them, we call it peridot. And when the, when the olivine is really pretty and you can see through, we call it jam quality. So the peridot is a jam quality uh, type of olivine. The next group is the, in, in the ferromagnesium silicate still, that, that means iron magnesium silicates, uh, is the ones with single chain structure in them. And the mineral here, what you have to know is the pyroxene. Pyroxene is a group name, so there is more minerals in it, but if you just know pyroxene, that's good. Most of the time they are dark colored. They have typical chain silicate structure inside, like here is the chain, like right here is the chain silicate, the chain, the chain, and here are the uh, cations in between, because remember it's Si206, and uh, one of the pyroxene is MGFE, FE, Si206, so here you have the, the uh, chain silicate and the cations which fulfill the four negative charges, the magnesium and iron in this case. So that's ferromagnesium silicate with chain silicate structure inside and that's pyroxene. The next one is the double chain. So ferromagnesium silicates with double chain in them and that's the amphibole. In this case you can see the double chain structure and in between the cations, okay? So double chain, this is amphibole. Amphibole is a uh, typical double chain uh, ferromagnesium silicate. Uh, amphibole, because of the, because of the covalently bounded, covalently bounded silica oxygen tetrahedron in between the cations are ionically bounded, so we have covalent. It's true for the other ones too. So this is covalent. And in between with the with the ions, it's ionic. So we have mixed structures in there. Uh, the covalent is always much stronger than the ionic structure. So therefore, when you hit these minerals, they will have pretty good cleavage, usually in two directions. So the amphibole, the pyroxene also, olivine does not have cleavage. So that's the typical double chain, uh, the amphibole. And then uh, we have the ferromagnesium silicates with sheet silicate structures in them. And those, 
uh, with the iron magnesium ones it's the it's the biotite the biotite is the black colored mica because they have these sheets the sheets in them when you hit this you don't even have to hit it you, you just can take it apart easily because it has this one perfect way of cleavage that way so this is the iron magnesium silicates with sheet silicate structure Sorry, here is the formula, but of course you don't have to know it. I'm just putting it down so you see the, the structure in it, the silicate structure. And the next one is uh, the group of the non-ferromagnesium silicate, means they do not have iron anymore, no iron. No iron, this is Fe. Uh, so the first one is the muscovite. The muscovite has typical um, sheet silicate structure, just like the bu the biotite. These two are in the mica group. So this is in the group of micas. So it is very similar to the biotite, but it doesn't have, it's not black, but this is actually see-through. So they used to use it for furnace window because it resists heat and you can see through. And it's very good isolator because of this very good cleavage. So there is always air in between the layers, micro group. Okay, the next one is the non-ferromagnesium silicates uh, with sheet silicate structures in them. These are the so-called clay minerals. And... Um, the only clay mineral so far, right now, you have to know is the kaolinite. And this here is the silica oxygen tetrahedrons. And uh, this is the cations in between. So see the sheets? And in between, you got the cations. So that's the kaolinite. Uh, interesting uh, fact about the kaolinite, that these minerals, basically, they are um, making up our dirt outside so when you look outside and you play in the clay that's basically kaolinite so it's all clay mineral with, with sheet silicate structure and when it gets wet actually water goes in between the wait wait this picture just shows you that the clay mineral uh, has these layers and when it gets wet actually it can suck up water in between the layers and when that happens it actually swells and when the water goes out, then actually it shrinks. So that's why on the surface so many times you see mud cracks on top of these clay minerals because, as I said, when it loses the water, it actually um, shrinks. The next group uh, in the non-ferromagnesium silicates, which means no iron but magnesium could be, uh, is the feldspars. Um, the feldspars are framework silicates, and you have to know a couple of them. The first one is the K feldspar. It's also called orthoclase. Uh, the orthoclase most of the time have a pink color. However, it could be uh, colorless or white, all the way to pretty dark reddish brownish. Uh, it's uh, the formula is K potassium aluminum. SI three O eight. Of course, you don't need to know this. It just I just write it down. So it's called potassium feldspar. But as I said, you can also call it orthoclase because orthoclase actually it's, is the name. The K feldspar just um, shows that it's potassium containing feldspar. So it is in the feldspar group. Now this is the still non-ferromagnesium silicate and we are still in the feldspar, uh, the framework silicate, sorry, and we are still in the feldspar group as I said, but now we are at the plagioclase, plagioclase, it's P, Pla it says right here plagioclase, the plagioclase is a group um, 
of six minerals starting with uh, anortite the anortite and that is usually anortite T. and so it's a-n-o-r-t-i-t-e anortite and anortite here is the formula it's calcium al2si2o8 <clears throat> And the other end member is the albite. So we are talking about a group of plagioclase um, where the two end member is the anortite, which is calcium plagioclase, we also call it. And the albite is the other one. And it's sodium, NaAlSi308. And uh, the calcium and the sodium are completely Na. The, the calcium and the so sodium can replace each other completely. So the difference among the six minerals, there is six altogether, uh, is the sodium-calcium ratio. So as you go from the calcium, 100% calcium, the anortite, and you go down to the albite, which is 100% sodium in the middle, you'll find feldspar, feldspar minerals, plagioclase minerals, I should say, uh, with less or more sodium and calcium content, you know, so it's in between. In the middle, you will have one with 50% calcium and 50% sodium and so on. So these are the so-called plagioclase uh, feldspars with the end members of calcium plagioclase, and this is that mineral right here. And the other end member is the, as I just said, the albite. A L B I T E. I already wrote down the formula. It's um it's sodium and A L S I three O eight. And it's always kind of white so it's easy to separate them because it's a, a very light colored where the other one is rather reddish brownish so you you do have to know I mean I don't care if you don't know the albite or the formula but you do have to know the sodium plagioclase the calcium plagioclase and that it's the feldspar group okay now the last silicate mineral you will have to know is the quartz and I kind of want you to know the formula, it's SiO2 and remember the quartz uh, is a framework silicate but it doesn't have any negative charge so it's a fulfilled, completely chemically fulfilled mineral as it is. It's covalently bonded and it's pretty hard and pretty durable, basically the most durable mineral, yeah, most durable mineral along with the clays on the surface of the earth. So it's kind of important that you know. And actually, you do find quartz everywhere. So it, it's kind of cool to know. Okay, the next group is the native elements. The native elements are elements which are going to be formed um, just by themselves. They don't make compounds. So they will be just um, as, as a one element formula. The first one we're going to talk about is the diamond. The diamond, you all know, is, is a very special uh, mineral. It contains carbon only. So you probably know that the diamond's formula is carbon. The carbon, the diamond forms at very high pressure and temperature. Basically, when you have a continental, continental breakup, the very first uh, magma formation is going to be the so-called kimberlite pipes. So the kimberlite, which is the first magma, which is coming up to the surface, and it's going to come up from the mantle along these pipe-like structures. So this is coming all the way from the mantle, and the, the rock which forms here is the so-called kimberlite. And the kimberlite, uh, these volcanoes are the ones which are bringing up the diamond from the mantle. So therefore, in this kind of volcanic rocks, 
uh, is when you actually have the chance to find diamond kimberlite. Kimberlite. This is very interesting. And you know, most of the diamond, when Pangea was together, you probably all have heard about it. And when it started to break up, one of the main uh, area where you would find diamonds is in Africa. But even in, in, in North America, like uh, in Arkansas, we have diamond mines. So, you know, Pangea broke up all over. So anywhere where it happened, today you might be able to find uh, diamonds. The next one is the graphite, and the graphite is uh, also carbon, and the difference is that it's uh, it formed under very low pressure and temperature, and uh, it has a much uh, more uh, weak structure. That's why it has very good. Uh, it has a good cleavage, and that's how we can use it for the pencil. Remember, um, and. We were talking about this before. And just one layer of the graphite is what we call the graphene. And the graphene, scientists believe it, is the material of the future. And on the next slide, I have two movies, and I hope it will play for you uh, when you play the slideshow. One is about info and graphene, and the other one is a futuristic use of the graphene. So I hope you can watch it. But uh, if not, then you can look it up yourself on YouTube. For, for some reason, if it doesn't work, it's called graphene. Graphene. Okay? So it's graphene. And one supposed to show the information, and the other one is a futuristic uh, uh, use which is really really cool and I'll stop right here I see you in the next segment